Around a week ago, we had a look at this. This is the NUC9 Extreme. It's a very small and very expensive new package from Intel. And we kind of came to the conclusion that yes, you can build a much more powerful ITX machine yourself, but there are some use cases where the NUC9 Extreme does make sense. And there is a lot to appreciate from a design standpoint here. The one that we've got here is a top spec model with the i9-9980HK. And although that is just technically a laptop CPU, it is completely overclockable. So that's what we're doing today. We're gonna to see how much more performance we can squeeze out of this little NUC9 Extreme. And I've got a feeling that some of you are going to be surprised. I certainly was in some areas that we're gonna be looking at. It's not your typical you know, strategy for overclocking where you raise the voltage and raise the CPU frequency and just kind of deal with the thermals. It's a lot different here and you could kind of tweak this to kind of fit your own Intel laptop CPU if that's what you're running as well. So why even bother doing this if the NUC9 doesn't really make sense for most people to buy in the first place? Well, it's a bit of fun for me personally, if I'm honest. I've never overclocked a mobile series CPU, and I'm also curious to see what the limits are in terms of power for the current NUC9 design. The compute unit, which houses the CPU, memory, and storage, doesn't have a whole lot in the way of cooling, Although surprisingly, the eight core 9980HK wasn't getting too hot under load. Still though, this right here is one of the real limits of buying into the NUC9 platform. It's not like an ITX build where you can just upgrade the CPU cooler. Also seeing as the mobile series CPU is the biggest hardware bottleneck of the NUC9, it's not like you can just upgrade to a 16 core 3950X like you can in an ITX machine. If you do end up buying a NUC, it's a good idea spending a few minutes tweaking things and getting your money's worth, or at least some of it. And do note that this overclocking walkthrough really only applies to the i9 model that we've got here. The other two models, the i5 and the i7, you're probably not going to have as much flexibility with the tools and the software that we'll take a look at in just a minute. Same with if you're gonna be doing this on a laptop, I can't really guarantee that you're gonna get the same improvements because we are using an unlocked processor here, not a locked i5 or i7, although I'm pretty sure that you should still have voltage and power limit adjustments on even those locked processors, but feel free to correct me down below if I'm wrong. Now the BIOS on the NUC9 doesn't offer a whole lot in terms of customization and power tuning, so this time around we'll be using Intel's XTU software instead. Here you've got access to the CPU voltage, power, and current, as well as the CPU core frequency multipliers. We'll get to those multipliers towards the end because for heavy loads like rendering and encoding, we do end up running into both power and current limits before those multipliers suppliers even matter. Essentially, we'll be able to overclock the NUC9 just by tweaking the power and voltage values. Now at stock, the 9980HK will briefly boost up to around 3.6 gigahertz under a heavy load with a 107 watt power limit. That lasts 28 seconds, at which point it will then settle down to around 3.1 gigahertz. In my initial video, I mistakenly said that the short duration turbo clock was 4.6 gigahertz, as you can see at the start of the graph, but that's only when two or so CPU cores are loaded. In this case, it's just loading the assets for the render. So the first step here is to see how far we can overclock the CPU simply by undervolting. By reducing the CPU voltage and leaving the power limit the same, the CPU will now be able to pull more current, allowing it to boost a little bit higher under the same power restriction. I had the most success here with a negative voltage offset, which you'll find in the top right. And just by setting this to minus 50 millivolts, we're able to increase the clock speeds by 150 megahertz. That's pretty substantial, but pushing it a little bit further, say minus 100 millivolts, the 9980HK is now sustaining a 300 megahertz higher boost clock than at stock under a rendering workload. An important note here, seeing as we're still hitting that power limit, 65 watts in this case, CPU thermals will be pretty much identical compared to stock. In the end, I was able to reduce the voltage offset to minus 135 millivolts, and this gave the i9 mobile CPU an effective 400 megahertz overclock under sustained loads. Again, that's an easy plus 400 megahertz gain at the same power consumption and thermals as at stock. The power target still sits at 65 watts with the i9 CPU settling in at around 75 degrees C. Now, if you wanna overclock a bit further, the next step is to start raising that 65 watt power 
limit that the CPU has under sustained loads. For example, by raising this to 75 watts, we now see another plus 200 megahertz. However, the CPU package temperature has now increased by around five to eight degrees. It's at this point that I noticed that no matter how far you raise the power and current limit, the NUC9 will still say that it's current limited as shown by the yellow alert in the bottom right. The user won't be able to exceed this and that means that along with our undervolt in place, we're pulling around 90 watts and sitting just below 4 GHz for all 8 cores. The CPU is getting a bit toasty at this point, but remember that this is effectively an 800 MHz overclock compared to what we were running at stock. Capping the power target at 85 watts would be a pretty sensible limit for frequent sustained load, and this had the i9 CPU maintaining a little over 3800 MHz in Blender. Thermals there weren't too bad either with the default fan profile, although noise levels were a bit louder than compared to stock. For most users, I would recommend just sticking to that 65 watt power target with the undervolt in place. You get a decent performance boost there in multi-core applications without any increase in noise, power, or thermals. For example, in Cinebench, we can see an 11% increase in performance just by applying the undervolt, and we're now running a bit faster than both a Ryzen 5 3600 and an i7-9700K. Those are both two very powerful desktop CPUs. By milking the i9 for every last drop of performance though, you can exceed 2700x performance here, now a 19% improvement over stock. Single core performance though doesn't get an increase here. For an improvement there, you'll want to adjust the single core, dual core, and three core multipliers, but don't expect to have that much headroom along with that undervolt in place. The eight core multiplier on the other hand does have a fair bit of headroom. It can be raised from 4.2 up to say 4.6 with the undervolt, and that will give you a higher clock speed under gaming loads. To be honest though, I didn't find that to be worth it. It doesn't look like you get any noticeable increase in gaming performance compared to when the i9 is just running completely stock. You're still going to be at a bit of a performance deficit compared to a full desktop chip. Having said that, some games won't experience too much of a performance drop, and this is why I think going with a laptop CPU wasn't too bad of an idea from Intel. The bad side is of course the price. Now don't forget that you can undervolt the GPU as well and significantly decrease both thermals and noise levels there too with no performance loss. For the ASUS RTX 2070 Mini that we're using in there now, I was able to decrease the operating voltage of the GPU down to around 875 millivolts and that was with a fairly typical boost clock of around 1850 MHz. This allows us to run about 4 degrees cooler but more importantly both of the GPU fans will be spinning around 430 RPM slower, giving us much lower noise levels. And here's what you can expect in terms of noise levels from a CPU render, both at stock and with the raised power limit. So if you do want to squeeze a bit more performance out of the NUC9 Extreme, that is exactly how I would do it. I think, you know, most of the performance that you can gain is in the multi-core applications, the sustained renders, for example. But then again, if that's kind of what you're interested in, you should probably build an ITX machine yourself, unless you really have a specific use case where the NUC9 Extreme just makes total sense. Again, in terms of the design, there is a whole lot to love here about the NUC9 Extreme. Five liters, easily portable, and you know, just the execution of the form factor is really solid. The price on the other hand doesn't make sense and the fact that we're able to overclock and reclaim some of that performance loss from the laptop CPU still doesn't make it worth it from a consumer's point of view. Again, if you are a studio, maybe a gaming cafe, maybe it would make sense for you because you can get a lot of these up and running, but we talk about that in the initial review. If you wanna watch that, I'll leave it linked down below. As always guys, a huge thanks for watching and I'll see you all in the next one.